I focus on the final boss, which is the US dollar. Stack sats and just keep hodling. I get the impression that it's almost like a bottle of champagne that we've shaken up, but we haven't yet popped the cork. Once you've taken the orange pill, you kind of step away from mainstream. How do I decentralize education? Well, I suppose I need to decentralize money first. The most skilled people, the most talented people, the most useful people, the most innovative people have all been self-taught. They love to increase their tuition fees. They love to fill their courses up with garbage classes. And why is it that, you know, you needed five years of education 50 years ago, and now you need like eight, nine, 10 years of education to be able to like get a regular job? It basically keeps people longer in that system and it does shape mindsets. As a guy who's been through university twice, if I'd been given certain tools and role models and examples and a bit of encouragement, I think I could have self-taught twice as much in half the time. What's happening to the families? Families are getting smaller. There are fewer and fewer people having children, so that means fewer and fewer families. They train us to basically follow orders and not question too much, and they're forming us to pay taxes. So you don't need to work away like crazy over time, burning out, overspending, over-consuming. You'll actually have a higher quality of life with a Bitcoin standard, so you will have time to pick up that book you've wanted to read. Bitcoin will help us get our time back. And with our time back, we can delve into things that are more stimulating than spreadsheets and traffic and keeping the boss happy. Scarcity is its beauty. Its scarcity is its uniqueness. And the type of scarcity it has hasn't existed before. I, I take a, a good pride in getting people on that have never been on a podcast. So like uh, you being one that already has two podcasts in there, like it's the third, like <laughs> you, you have more experience than, than like uh, some of the, <laughs> some of the people that I have on, but I like that. I, li I like people having people on that are not on every podcast because I think it gets boring after, <laughs> after a while. Yeah. I mean, there's like, there's a lot of repetition at the moment, unfortunately with podcasts, uh, in Bitcoin, like, uh, you know, if we haven't got any scandals or anything like FTX blowing up or like some major war going on with ordinals, there's not a lot more to say really at the moment, because it's the same talking heads. You know, I kind of got a little bit saturated personally with podcasts as well. There's not many I listen to nowadays. I listen to other stuff outside of of Bitcoin. You know, when you work in Bitcoin, you, you, when you finish your shift at the end of the day, you don't want to delve back into Bitcoin all the time. So uh, there's other things happening in the world. So politics and economy and um, politics mainly, man, is crazy at the moment. How um, how everything's shaping up and it's next week, the election. So I've just been keeping my eyes on that. It's like better than anything on Netflix is the US election story and the campaign. So I, I've been watching that. <laughs> it's nice. like such a such a epic episode every 24 hours there's like a new event to follow so i've been following it quite a bit yeah i think uh i mean i think that's always happens with the u.s election it's such a big event and the americans make make it also really big and and uh when when elon musk the, the richest guy on earth says like oh it, if donald trump doesn't get in uh the office uh democracy will vanish in the next four years like <laughs> that gets a lot of excitement and a lot of drama <laughs> I, th I think it's overdone like i think it's too dramatic because uh the, literally the 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 Kamala Harris was uh, the last four years vice president and Trump was already president. So I don't know if we have a, a, a huge change, no matter who comes into office, because they both kind of were already in the administration. Uh, but it's it's funny to see. Yeah, it definitely takes a lot of uh, eyeballs off Bitcoin and to politics. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's kind of like uh, not a not a bad thing. Like it for the moment, I just can't wait for it to be over. I'm wondering what's coming next, you know, because everything's been building towards this next Tuesday, and then obviously it'll be from November till about January until they get sworn in. Whoever's next. But then after that, I can't wait to just like, you know, change the channel. Like it's like it's like the final series of Game of Thrones, you know, like you watched it and watched it and watched it. And by the end, you were just like, just finish this now. <laughs> and they did a horrible job at finishing Game of Thrones. Like the last season was just garbage. Um, but I was just happy it was over. I was like, I can do other stuff with my life now. So but really obviously we're, cool. all, we're all kind of following it and we're all watching what's going on. But uh, there's nothing we can do. Uh, you know, I'm not in the US, so but we're really close. We're really close being in Canada, so there's a lot of uh, dependency on uh, on U.S. politics, U.S. economy. Mm, it's kind of interesting. We hit an all-time high in the Canadian dollar versus Bitcoin on the Bitcoin pairing, but they haven't hit an all-time high on the U.S. dollar Bitcoin pairing, which just we goes also to show. The... Uh, sorry, no, sorry, go ahead. No, so uh, it just goes to show, you know, how the the currencies are how how we're losing out. The Canadian dollar is losing out on the US dollar. I'm not sure how uh, you're in Europe at the moment. Are you in the Eurozone? 
Uh, yes, uh, I'm in the Eurozone and I think we also hit a, in, in the Euro an all time high. I mean, in the US dollar, we also almost hit it. Like <laughs> it's very close to hitting it. Uh, so it's, 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 it's not that much, but yeah, I, Euro, I think Euro hit it. Like I honestly, I track US dollar <laughs> more than, than Euro because yeah. I, mean, I really don't care what you. Right? That's that's who we're competing against. Like uh, you know, some people ask me how much is a Bitcoin in Canadian dollars. I'm like, Shit, I don't really know. I don't. I you know, I focus on the final boss, which is the U.S. dollar. That, that's true. Yeah, I I like for the last uh, two months, I've been tracking the U.S. dollar price in Bitcoin. Before that, there was like a year. You asked me what the Bitcoin price is. I didn't. I didn't even know. Like mm. because it was so um, so boring. There was no not a lot of price action. Uh, there was this all time high in April with the halving and stuff like that. Uh, but it, it was not really interesting for me for some reason. But now I feel like there is more excitement coming. Like it feels like the start of of, of some new excitement, the start of something maybe bigger in Bitcoin and all of this. Yeah, we have the election and it's like now also the season for Bitcoin to go up. Let's see if it actually comes. Uh, but for some reason now I've been tracking it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it because there's a lot of, uh, it's a harder, the price is even harder to understand now. It was always very hard to understand if it's going to go up or down, which is why, you know, the best approach is just to stack sats and just keep hodling. And uh, regardless of price, if it goes down, you buy more. If it goes up, you maybe share a meme. But um but at the moment with uh, the ETFs and all of the, the huge industry that's packed in and with, with the political climate as well, it's really hard to know, okay, what, what is controlling the price at the moment? I get the impression that it's almost like a bottle of champagne that we've shaken up, but we haven't yet popped the cork. I get that impression, but it's just an impression, you know, it, it, anything could happen. But I kind of feel like there is some kind of suppression of price going on. I feel like there's a lot of people talking about it, a lot of people looking at Bitcoin, but it's not really moving yet. I think we're waiting on on certain things to kind of s take place. And even historically, you know, with the halving having happened, we're right on track. You know, we're where it should be. Like, it's, it's, it's just a number at the end of the day. Bitcoin keeps winning. Bitcoin is still running. Like, uh, the, the network's still there. And, and that's, that's what we should be focusing on. But obviously, yeah, price action around this time of year always is always quite interesting. But, um, yeah. yeah, but I mean, it's kind of fascinating actually that we are that high. Uh, I want to show you this with the interest because like there's, there's this, first of all, like this, um, personal feeling of, of being in Bitcoin and seeing, uh, what, what's going on in, in the world of, of, of Bitcoin. Uh, and then you talk with normies, you talk with family members, you talk with your colleagues, uh, and, and you're like, ah, oh, like nobody really cares about Bitcoin right now. And we're almost at the all time high. And then I, I always I go ahead and, and uh, I will pull this up, uh, quite quickly here. Let me see. Um, the Google Trends chart I always like to look at because this kind of indicates for me uh, how many people are Googling it, how, many, how much interest from a retail kind mm. of perspective is in Bitcoin. And if you see that, like we are so low <laughs> yeah. I, to, to, uh, right now and the price is, uh, is higher than uh, it was like around here. So it's it's, it's fascinating for me to, to see that we are actually uh, having that high price without a lot of excitement. It might be just institutional money. Yeah. Also, I don't know, like from following the elections, like you realize how many people are plugged into mainstream media and how many people won't even get access to the price. You know, like people aren't going to just search sporadically, like pre-coiners, no bit, non-Bitcoiners, whatever. I'm going to be like, hey, let's check on the Bitcoin price. You know, people who kind of know what's going on because we're in a sub section of, of society, you know, we're in like a marginal section. Um, but we don't realize it because we spend a lot of time in it. You know what I mean? It's kind of like an echo chamber a little bit. And it's kind of, uh, once you've taken the orange pill, you kind of step away from mainstream stuff. Um, so I kind of forget that like all my, well, my neighbors, my family, my friends are all still uh, surfing around in what I, where I used to be maybe like four years ago. So it's a long time that I've just kind of been like, okay, I'll open up Telegram and Twitter and check my group chats and listen to some live streams. But I don't read the newspaper. I don't hang out in the, 
in the coffee room at work, like talking about like, I don't even know what the weather's going to be like anymore. Like <laughs> I just tuned out from like so much stuff just to put all my energy into something that I care about. And I think it'll make a difference. But then when, when, when you meet people who've, who've not taken that step, like, you know, on falling down, whatever you want to call it, the rabbit hole, the orange pill. And then you realize like, oh my gosh, like there's people who we're worlds apart i think is is the way to see it so like as an educator in bitcoin it's it's i'm having to go back and kind of position myself at that part of the journey which is step one step two but it's it's hard to go back to those steps when for myself it was like something that i started on like four or five years ago seriously so um so yeah just kind of working things back because if, if we want to help people get on board with Bitcoin, we've got to realize that there's, there's changes that we've made in our lives that give us a certain perspective. And it's not everybody who shares that perspective because they haven't taken those steps yet. So, you know, you, you don't want to kind of um, radicalize people straight away to becoming toxic maxis that just have, you know, Matrix and Nostra. And, but at the same time, we've got to realize that's where we are right now. So if we're talking from that place it's stuff isn't going to land. Like people aren't going to get what we're talking about. Like people just think I'm crazy most of the time, but like my Bitcoin friends know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Did you see the video where they walked around and asked people on the street what the current Bitcoin price is? Yeah. Who was doing that? Was that, um, I think it was like Joe Nakamoto did it a while ago as well. And like, there's another person being like, what do you think the price is? And people are just way out, you know? So way completely out. way out. Like the the guesses were like, yeah, like what is it, ten euros? I was like, what? <laughs> like yeah. that, that's like not even a little bit close. <laughs> so I yeah. think uh, to your point, I think we're actually in a, a time where we are so plugged into this new system already, but we kind of forget sometimes that ninety nine percent of the world <laughs> is still somewhere else. And I started this like a while ago now that I listen again to mainstream media for like two, three, four minutes and see like the highlight shows every day uh, from Austrian news. Uh, this is quite interesting to see, to be honest, because I was plugged into this, this uh, watching mainstream media, like also like maybe four or five years ago. Uh, and comparing it now is like, wow, I like, I, <laughs> I have a whole different viewpoint on, on all those topics now, but I think it's important that we um, go back. Like, even if we go, if we make the matrix, like they break out of the matrix, but they also go in ba back in and, and fight the evil people in the matrix. Uh, yeah. So I, I think it's, we kind of have to also, fight in the regular system that's why i also don't like when people say like no let's go all to nostra no, no like we we have to also be yeah. on normal platforms and fight there uh for bitcoin we cannot hide and make like a, a small parallel uh universe that might work but it probably works better if we uh if we are the digital soldiers that, that like are for bitcoin in those normal places also yeah. in our family in our neighborhood it's, it's so important i feel like yeah, I think like the soldiers is like a good example, right? So like, um, I've always had this kind of questioning about, you know, the, the Bitcoin Citadel mentality, you know, like, you know, the Bitcoiners will live up on this hill with their Citadel protected by the walls, we'll have everything we need. But the Citadel isn't the battleground, right? You know, the soldiers need to leave the Citadel to march down the hill to meet the the allies and the enemies and the foes and the challenges on the battleground. And I, I think that's part of it is 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 realizing that we're already very well sheltered from a lot of the bullshit that goes on, but 99% uh, of the people ain't. So you've got to work out that, hey, if we want to actually do this job of what I still call evangelizing people, you know, uh, helping them wake up to, to what Bitcoin can offer, you got to leave the Citadel. And it doesn't mean you have to compromise on everything you've built up over the past few years. You know, as a Bitcoiner, you can still stay resilient to all of these uh these normy alt like mainstream ways of of kind of moving through information you can go back to the citadel at the end of the day but if you want to meet people you gotta you gotta leave that kind of protected gated community that is the bitcoin twitter sphere or the the nostra realms or the the podcasts and the articles because it's uh it's not what the people who i want to talk to are, uh, are tuned into the people who i want to talk to are the people who are like what wait how 
how does this work? What, what's this concept? Like, um, those are the interesting conversations for me. And that's, I suppose, why I've tuned out a little bit of, of listening to nonstop Bitcoin podcasts. Because, um, and I think that's kind of like what, a, you know, there was um, Peter McCormack, you know, he's, he's pivoted recently with his, with his podcast, which is nice. You know, I think he's kind of worked it out as well that Bitcoiners talking to Bitcoiners, talking about Bitcoin is kind of very one dimensional. Um, and it is necessary because, you know, like uh, there'll be people listening to this now who may be listening to their very first Bitcoin podcast. And it'll help give them an idea of, of what's going on. And it's always a good entry point or people can delve. People have very like certain guests they really love to listen to. I have like some top Bitcoiners, whatever they make, any content I'll tune into. But um, a lot of the time, like my, my job here at Bull Bitcoin is is evangelization and, and helping people understand Bitcoin. And people who've listened to like, you know, they've done the 10,000 hours. They, they're probably like way beyond what I can tell them right you know so um i'm just trying to leave the citadel a little bit and get out of the comfort zone i think it is a, a bit of a comfort zone when it comes to orange pilling people and i think like bitcoin educators are kind of stepping out now and it, it's nice to see like more and more educators like reaching out and making public events and risking a bit of their uh, reputation maybe by being like hey i'm gonna put it on an event but i don't know if anyone's gonna show up and you know Everybody I talk to it does meetups or like uh, Meet Premier Bitcoin courses or um, presentations. Like th they all get back to me being like, yeah, there was like zero people showed up or like, yeah, there were three people showed up. But they tweet it anyway and they adv advertise it anyway. And they'll say like, yeah, I'm here and no one's here and it's okay. Like I, I think that's necessary now. That's the next step because we can't control the narrative of the mainstream, but we can't withdraw completely from mainstream discussions with with people who are in that sphere it's got to be something that uh that we can kind of uh yeah that, that we can kind of like challenge people on and i think that's where the battlefield is at the moment for me absolutely and i always think back of like this video of andreas antonopoulos staying in this like half empty room in front of like a few people and explaining bitcoin uh and at that time if someone watched it it probably looked even sad like oh like oh this is this new thing but nobody cares about it and and he's talking about it and now 10 years later we all say like oh that was a legendary moment like he, yeah. he got it so early on no, and, and that's, that's, that's totally right. Like, um, looking, it, it's always the question and it, it doesn't matter if it's about buying Bitcoin. Like, you know, if, if you look back to when you bought Bitcoin for the first time, it was the smartest thing you probably did. I know that's how I see it, but like hindsight is always twenty twenty. Like, I love that expression. I use it a lot, but the way we look back on the past is like, wow, like for the Antonopoulos example, you just gave perfect one. Those are like classic moments. Those are like, wow, like. That was such a pivotal moment. Exactly the way it was explained at that point in time was super important to the evolution of, of learning about Bitcoin. But at the time, if you were in the room, you'd be like, what's this guy talking about? You know, like <laughs> if, if it, it's the time that makes a difference. So I'm hoping that eventually, you know, I can look back on the stuff that I'm doing and be like, yeah, you remember that meetup where no one showed up? That was awesome. Like one of my buddies always tells me, he's like, we'll look back when we're old men and we'll be like, these are the good old days, you know, like, um, I don't want to get too comfortable by just being like hanging out with Bitcoiners and talking Bitcoin all the time. I want to be a little bit uncomfortable and, and, uh, try and try and meet some people who, who don't agree with me and try and try and have the discussions and, and make it work or show up to empty rooms and hand out flyers that people throw out. You know, I think it's, it's what we got to do. Hmm. Absolutely. And I think, uh, to, to the earlier point that we made, I think it's also important for us to get an identity outside of Bitcoin, <laughs> like, uh, like Bitcoiner, like right now it's legit if you are a Bitcoiner, uh, because it's just a, such a huge topic and there's such a huge interest in it. But at some point, Bitcoin will be quite boring, uh, itself. There might be interesting stuff happening on top of Bitcoin. Uh, but Bitcoin, the protocol, it will be like, everyone is like, ah, of course, Bitcoin. Like, it's like the TCPIP protocol. Like, everyone agrees on it kind of fine to the future. I'm talking. Uh, so like, we have to 
have to get an identity outside of of being a bitcoiner and and have other interests also so i think it's a healthy thing where bitcoiners that are already long in the in the game that get like saturated of of bitcoin content and they might like oh like i want to find out about new stuff i want to listen to other things i want to i don't know learn how to play guitar (laughs) something and mm. but there's at the same time new people coming that just like start in year one and they have to learn all those things that the experience bitcoin has the last five years heard so i think it's great that we have so much bitcoin only content uh but yes i also see like new people coming slowly and all the people maybe saying like oh yeah like i i, I I grow out a little bit of that. Uh, I, I, I listen to a few and fewer podcasts. For me, when I started the podcast, this was kind of the moment where I stopped listening to other podcasts because I do it daily. Yeah. So my Bitcoin podcast is kind of that. that. So I understand uh, if you work 100% in Bitcoin, um, you're kind of like, you know, like I, I, I want to be uh, outside of Bitcoin like the last two hours of my day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but for but for people that like have the whole day and they're doing something else, they really look forward maybe to a Bitcoin podcast and and tune in f- out from the out out of the fiat world but into Bitcoin world with those podcasts. So so I think the, it's it's a great place to to be in, and uh, I think it's great that we have so many options also. <laughs> yeah, one hundred like um. I totally agree with that. I think it's like the 80, 20% ratio. Like, um, you know, before I was working in Bitcoin, before I was lucky enough to, to find my place in Bitcoin, I was probably like 80% was fiat job and, you know, regular life and punching in, punching out and talking with colleagues. And, and then 20% was like getting home and like putting on podcasts and making food and just trying to like, uh, like tap into something different. And over the last few years, I've managed to flip that ratio. So now it's like 80% of my time is is doing all of the Bitcoin stuff and talking with my colleagues about Bitcoin and, and about everything around Bitcoin as well. We have some really awesome conversations as Bitcoiners. And then the 20% is like, okay, end of the day, I'm just going to watch some garbage or tune back in or like listen to the, the radio or play some music or, you know, do other stuff. But I think like, um, I'm not sure how many people in Bitcoin actually are in Bitcoin because they they want to do something else later on and they see that Bitcoin is the way to get there. I think there's a lot of people, like for example, it's true for myself, a little bit of history about myself. I used to, like my first jobs were, um, were working in finance. I used to work in TradFi and I realized they couldn't change anything in TradFi. You know, I wanted to change like the allocation of assets in mutual funds. I was like, man, we should like, we shouldn't fund these garbage companies. We should have like really awesome investments for our clients and and I realized quickly, like, buddy, you work on the phones and customer support. You, no one's going to listen to you about which assets the fund manager should select. So I was like, okay, I could spend my entire life trying to climb that ladder to be an important guy where I can make decisions that would, would kind of change finance. And I was like, I don't want to do that because it involved doing a lot of things that a lot of time and I'm pu- putting a lot of time and energy into something that you don't believe in to eventually try and make the change at the end. Um, which I think is what a lot of people try and do in careers. You know, you're like, hey, I'll just put in 20 years of my life. And when it's my turn, I'll make everything better. I was like, man, that's such a a bad way around to do things. So then I pivoted and I I left finance and I went to work in education because I was like, I can make a difference straight away, right? You know, I'll be like in a classroom, I'll have students and uh, we'll have fun and we'll learn together. And, you know, I can make a lot of decisions immediately. You know, like they, they front load you as a teacher. You have to decide everything straight away about how you run your class. But then I actually realized that it, it's not that true. You know, as a teacher, there are there are core things that you still can't change and it's to do with the curriculum and it's to do with, um, you know, I, I was becoming a, a student teacher during COVID. So just, just the way that um, there were so many rules, restrictions and requirements. And, and I was like, wow, this is really as institutionalized as finance, but it's public versus private. I was like, man, what's the problem with both of these things? And then I was learning about Bitcoin and I learned that magical word decentralization. And I was like, okay, so Bitcoin's decentralized, but that's kind of what the issue is with education. And that's kind of what the issue is with finance as well. Right. And I was like, okay, so everything I suppose needs to be a little bit decentralized. We live in a post globalist world and governments have got bigger and bigger and control more and more spheres of our lives. And so do the corporations and the dot coms. So it's like, hey, like this decentralization concept is amazing. 
but I want, I still want to return to teaching, right? You know, I, I still see myself as a teacher first and a Bitcoiner second, but I don't want to teach in centralized education because it's not my way of teaching. It's not, it's not what I believe in. Right. I, and that's why I had to leave. So I was like, well, how do I decentralize education? I was like, well, I suppose I need to decentralize money first. <laughs> So the, so this was like a long way and it might take my entire life. I might never get there, but eventually I want to move back into the classroom. Once we've separated money from state, then we'll be able to separate education from state and have a lot more like local based curriculums. And like, I do a bit of homeschooling at the moment as well, but it, it, these are like some of the core values that you learn as a Bitcoiner. And then you want to implement them into the rest of your life, but you work out real quickly that you can't do until we've fixed the money. So your 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 kind of call to action is like well if you want to do this thing later in life you got to fix the money first it's it's like the, it's like the the point of that you can't skip past like you know i could go back into finance i could go back into education but if i thought about it enough the problem of the broken money that we use and the, the way it's used against us rather than for us would would become a problem i think that's why i work in bitcoin you know is is not because i want to like be an old man at 85 still working in bitcoin you know like i want to fix the things that bitcoin proposes to fix and then go about doing other things you know i want to teach i love teaching especially working with young people like I think their imaginations, the way they pick up information, the way they have enthusiasm is awesome. But I can't do that until like we have a slightly better Bitcoin standard, maybe not hyper Bitcoinization, but until, you know, there are enough families that are like, hey, we don't need to put our kids through the government public system. There's all these other schools and school boards and, and cooperatives where we can decentralize education, decide what our kids are learning and help our kids learn and play a better role in their education. And that's what I'd like to do eventually. And I'm not sure if that's true for a lot of Bitcoiners out there, but I think it is. Like, I think when I talk about with my colleagues, like everybody has these later on projects like, oh, after we've won the war about sound money, I'll do this, right? Um, I'm not sure how many people are Bitcoiners because they just want to be forever Bitcoiners. I think it's just we see it as a necessary step to get to where we want to go. Sorry. I love that view. I think I never had that uh, like that on, on on the podcast, and uh, I I loved it a lot. It's one of the reasons why I renamed my podcast from a Bitcoin brand to just my name because I was like, I will not talk about Bitcoin <laughs> all my life. If Bitcoin becomes boring for me because it's already so successful, I will stop talking about it on the yeah. podcast, <laughs> like because uh, it th then the podcast will suck if if I'm not generally uh, interested in the, in the topic. Obviously, uh, I don't know when this happens because I think the next like three to five years will be super super interesting. Maybe even like ten years, but beyond ten years. I don't know if it's still uh, interesting uh, uh, to be <laughs> uh, uh, talking about Bitcoin uh, every day. Uh, but yeah, for the next five years, I'm, I'm fairly certain that it will be super interesting uh, to be in that space and maybe beyond that, not that much. But one interesting point also for, for what you said is decentralized um, education. I mean, I got from like age 17 or 18, uh, I kind of discovered online education. If it's like audiobooks, uh, podcasts, YouTube, online courses, Sailor Academy, uh, stuff like that. There's a lot of on the, on the, that kind of educated me a lot. Like, I, I mean, I, I consumed a lot. I was like consuming me too much and, and not doing enough <laughs> about it, uh, but it was really good. Uh, and the rest of that, what I learned was maybe in the job, uh, from, from what I know now and a little bit was from the education system. So I think we are, um, if you really want to get educated, decentralized, it's already possible. Uh, but homeschooling and especially the education before age 16, I would say that's a huge part. And that's the influential part. I think what you're also talking about. Yeah, no, I think like your path is like totally, um, totally the perfect example of where we're at at the moment. You know, the, the most skilled people, the most talented people, the most useful people, um, the most innovative people have all been self-taught pretty much. Right. I mean, like, um, everybody who's running some type of interesting projects, there's been, yeah, a kind of foundational base of, of institutional education, but then to become the person they are, like the most interesting people out there, they're all self-taught. 
you know, um, information has been decentralized, but education hasn't yet. So we're at this kind of friction point where we have access to all the information we need right now. So for the motivated and for the driven and for the in intellectual folks, like, that's great. Like, you know, the, the valves are open. You have access to all information. Go ahead and devour it and synthesize it and process it and integrate it and get out there and use it. But then, uh, then for the people who aren't on that side of the bell curve, right, you know, it's, it's still like, no, well, I, I'll just go to, through, the, through the system and they'll give me a good education. And that's less and less true. Like the system is giving you a worse and worse education. Like, and I'm not sure if it's worse and worse, but it's becoming like, um, I had a term for it the other day. Basically, we're seeing like fiat education because, I, you know, we are getting slightly better competencies and skills. But I remember like in my, um, in my uh, if you look back across generations, you see like what was essential to have as education. Like my dad dropped out of secondary school and that was like, you know, you needed your secondary school to get a job, good job. He went into trades and he picked stuff up and he was more manual. So he lived a good life and he went from there into a master's degree, like out of nowhere as, as uh, you know, when he was 40 years old. But in his, in his growing up period, in his generation, like you needed secondary school. That was like the requirement. And then you go a little bit further down the road and you needed like some kind of secondary education. So in the UK, we have like a college and in Canada, they have like a CEGEP and things. So you needed that. That became like the new standard. And nowadays, young people have to get a job at a university, a, a diploma through a university to get, get the chance of having any type of bureaucratic admin, whatever fiat job they want to get. So I'm not sure if it's like they're inflating education you know what I mean? Because you have to spend longer and longer in the system to get a workable education. So, you know, people are becoming long, more and more dependent on the educational system for a lot longer of their time to be able to be released into society as deem, you know, fit citizens who can then go out and get a job. And I'm not sure if like the job I do today is a lot more complicated than the job that say my dad would have done in in the fifties or sixties, like, you know, I do work with a computer, but it doesn't take like, um, all of these like critical theory, literature analysis courses or like philosophy, you know, you can self teach all of the stuff you want to do to make yourself grow as an individual. But in terms of like, um, the requirements to get a job, I think they've inflated that so much now that and the institutions like the universities absolutely love it. They love to increase their tuition fees and they love to extend with, they love to fill their courses up with garbage classes. And I think we are seeing like an inflation of education as well. And it's probably related to the money. I mean, everything is. So why is it that, you know, you needed five years of education 50 years ago and now you need like pretty much like, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 years of education to be able to like get a regular job working for the, a company or a government. I'm not sure, but um, it basically keeps people longer in that system and it does shape mindsets. It stops, it actually, instead of broadening horizons, like the self-learned homeschooled or, you know, the people who are out there traveling or just picking up experience or working, I think it actually blinkers your experience. The longer you spend in the, in, in the education system, the more you get blinkered. So... I don't know. I just, I just see it as like a, a kind of centralized force that's becoming more and more required, but less and less relevant because information has been released. So why not release the students, you know, set them loose, give them a framework if they want to. But um, I don't see why we should be clinging to this thing as like a must and an essential. You know, if you want to be a doctor and engineer, fine, you need to go through those levels. But um, as, a guy who's, as a guy who's been through university twice, like... I could have self-taught everything in half the time if I'd been given certain tools and role models and examples and a bit of encouragement. I think I could have self-taught twice as much in half the time. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis 
Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. I see that a lot actually um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Bitcoin community less and less, but even from them uh, who are maybe older and didn't discover Bitcoin first, but also like in, in the normal community where people come out of with like 28, 32 from university and never really worked for anything. Like they, they just studied all their lives basically. Uh, and then they come to know like, oh yeah, like this degree is kind of required for like a high level job, but they, they don't know <laughs> they don't know what's going on in, in in the actual job market and then uh they might be in like a big fiat company where uh they they they're like just like stuck with that what they actually wanted to escape with with the university like there's a, a um, intellectual gap there and it, it's really interesting for me to to look at um the, that fiat education system. I never thought of uh, the education system being inflated, but it's true. Like more, more people need longer and longer. It also delays uh, people having kids uh, um, yeah. uh, uh, later and later because they're like, yeah, I'm done with my studies with like 28. I need a good income for my kid. Then it's like 32. Uh, and then it's like, oh, I have kids with 35 or 40. Uh, previous, like uh, in my mom's and dad's generation, it was like, yeah, you have kids with like 25 or like something like that. Or like maybe even it was not abnormal to have kids with like 23 or something like that. So it's really interesting how this money and uh, centralized education and this fiat system and then on the birth rates and like this all kind and it somehow is connected and this this old saying fix the money fix uh, fix the world it it, it might actually be true <laughs> yeah yeah no, i think so and i think like that example that you used of like the family as a key metric like if we see that the family is the smallest unit of society you know um and then a family you know includes children and children are sent into the education system then they spend long, you know, what's happening to the families, families are getting smaller, families are being less and less, you know, um, there are, there are, there are fewer and fewer people having children. So that means fewer and fewer families. So if we're measuring society as like, uh, if we're taking family as the measurement of how successful a society is, then actually society is not doing as well as it used to be because families are getting smaller and people are struggling to have families uh, economically and just just in terms of time preference. But, you know, if, if we look at education and the impact it has on families, then that's huge, right? And, and if you were to decentralize education, then the decentralization process, and that's what you see with homeschools, Homeschools is like, you know, the opposite end of that decentralization process. It, it essentially puts the family at the center of the education. And, you know, it, I think that there is kind of a, you know, there's, there's a spectrum of what you can do between like all in for the public system and then all in for the homeschool. There's, there's hybrid models and there's different ways that parents use resources locally and in, in local communities. 
But um, I suppose what you've got to do is put the family back in the education system, you know, so the family has a bit more control because if we want a successful society, we need to have successful families. And if the families are being removed from education, then we end up that the education decides a lot of things and the negative impact is on the family. Like, you know, if you go through the basic education system of like secondary school, then post-education, you get a bachelor's and then you leave and you get a professional job. And like you said, you have to work a few years to get a good revenue and a good income that you can have a family with. Then that's, yeah, it's, it's becoming quite late and it's becoming later and later. But if you want to be a specialist now, like I have certain friends who, you know, they do the bachelor's, then the master's, then the doctor, the PhD. And like it, that lifestyle, like, um, you know, it's, it's very much in the brain. But then when you finish and you're like, okay, I've got my PhD, then when shows up the family, because that's quite late in life, you know, that's, uh, that's late twenties, early thirties. Um, and, and then like, you just need to pivot like that and be like, okay, career and family, let's go. Um, I don't know, but uh, it, they never teach you how to work, really, the education. I always found it really funny. They never. Really, I remember the first time I got a job, I was like maybe 12 years old. I was too young to work. But anyway, I worked in a local pub in the UK. And um, I just stood there, like waiting to be told what to do. And like it, it, I lasted a week in this job and I got fired. Uh, they had to let me go. They were like, you're way too young. You don't know how to work. And I was like, that's right. I learned that at 12. I was like, I don't know how to work. And like all the way through the, my following education, like I knew how to respond to tasks that were given to me and I knew how to wait and for exam season and study and cram and write a paper because they told me what they require and when it's due by and what I should be approaching it. And, you know, they give you a lot of structure, but then in the workspace, you don't get that structure all the time spoon fed to you like the education system does. So you become quite dependent. And this is this it's hilarious when people leave, whatever, whether they leave at secondary school or like after university or even like as a postdoc, whatever. Then they arrive in the workplace and it's like, OK, they wait to be given work to be done and a deadline. And sometimes you just got to get out there and hustle and and find work and create work and collaborate and and all of these things that have to be from yourself, you have to be quite driven in a different way. And I think the education system, you're always waiting for them to tell you what to do um, and how to do it. And then you're waiting for their approval, which is the way you measure your success in education. But work doesn't really work like that. You have to just get out there and sometimes not care what people think if you want to innovate. And sometimes if there's nothing to do, you have to find something to do. And Sometimes if it's not clear, you have to sculpt away at a project that's you're not sure where it's going yet, but you're sure it'll work out. And driving towards those type of solutions is something that I think they kind of shy away from in the traditional education system as well. So it doesn't really create the best habits. Um, and again, self-taught people don't have those those fallbacks because they've driven themselves. They will read books that they're not sure why they're reading it, but eventually down the line, it becomes really useful. And they're like, wow, okay, I'm forming this sense of, of my intellectual identity myself rather than getting spoon fed it. And those people are, are great assets. And I think that's, that's something that like um, countries like El Salvador are working out. They were like, we need these people to come in, you know? And that's why they're handing out, they had a great passport program. And they were like, if you study philosophy, like we're gonna bring you in. Or like, if you're like an entrepreneur and you have businesses, we're gonna bring you in. They can tell who the self-driven people are. And I, I think like education system isn't really the self-driven people. Do you, do you think with with a Bitcoin standard uh, on a global world, do you think we, we get to a place where more of those people actually exist? Like we, we have a higher percentage of the self-driven, self-taught people and less of like, uh, yeah, I'm in this line and I will, t I will do exactly as I told, like this factory worker mentality? I think so. I think so. And that's mainly because like um, it's mainly not going to directly affect the education system but maybe indirectly affect well there'll be t there'll be two aspects right so the the government's role and how they control the money and how they form us to basically pay taxes later on they're kind of incentives to you know we they call the, the 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 department like human resources right when you, you go to any big company they have a human resources team so that kind of approach of like we're just resources for them i think that's like really ingrained in the education system as well like you know they they train us to basically follow orders and not question too much and basically get the job and you know they're, they're forming us to pay taxes that's that's the government's main interest in education is to 
make good citizens and good citizens pay their taxes and don't question too much, right? So, you know, that's that's one aspect. So if you separate the state from money, they're going to have less power over us to to manipulate us that way for sure and less less fear to install and less violence to inflict through the tax system. But also on the flip side of things, you know, you're going to have a higher quality of life. Like your money in the future is worth money more than your money in the present. So, you, you know, your time preference changes. So you don't need to work away like crazy over time, burning out, overspending, over consuming. Like, you know, you'll actually have a higher quality of life with a Bitcoin standard. So you will have time to pick up that book you've wanted to read. You won't have to sit for hours in traffic. You know, you can you can tune back into what is more essential and you can take care of your family and spend more time. You know, I think we'll get our time back essentially is what I'm saying. We'll get a bit more of our time back. And then it's, it's, it's something that you hear in technology and I've heard it like, you know, I'm, I'm like 37 at the moment, but I've heard it maybe like every five years, there'll be something in technology that comes about and it'll be like, Oh, we'll get our time back again. You know, like it was like, Oh, the computer is going to do all these calculations for us. So we'll get our time back. And then they put the internet on the computer and it's like, ah, the internet's got all the information. We'll get our time back. And then AI comes out and it's like, hey, AI has come out and we'll get our time back. And so far it's never worked. We just spend more and more time on that technology, you know. I like I come from a region in 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 the UK where you know the industrial revolution was was pretty much birthed in the area that I grew up in. And uh, when the first machines came out, they were like, "Ah, oh, this is great! Like we'll be able to like weave so much more t like textiles. We'll get our time back." And it, it's never been true. And I've always had like uh, they call them the Luddites, you know, the people who fought against the machines when they were first created. I've it's ironic. I work on a computer. I'm talking to you via a computer. I work in Bitcoin and I work, you know, I have like four screens around me at the moment, but I've always had something deep down, which is a bit of like a Luddite kind of like rage against the machine. Like we don't need the machine. Eventually the machine will give us our time back. And I, I think it wasn't even ever about the machine. I think it was more about the money, you know, the, 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 the capital incentives to implant technology and, increase our, our reliance on technology rather than technology doing its own thing like and it's nice like bitcoin just does work right it it doesn't take for me anyway it doesn't take i don't need to like crank up bitcoin every morning like it's just working for me in the background and i don't trade it you know i, I don't have to like stop loss and take profit and try and outsmart it like i just let it do its thing um and it does its thing with with my time and energy that i've saved and I've banked it and it's, I've put it into Bitcoin. So slowly but surely, I am actually getting my time back. I can feel it like, you know, in the last four years, like my time preference is changing. It's not just a concept. It's, uh, you know, you start slowly thinking, hey, like that maybe this this is the technology that will give us our time back. It's It's not going to be like the... And, you know, I could look back in this in 10 years and be like, we were wrong. But right about now where I'm sat, Robin, like... and. And everything I've learned about Bitcoin, I, I do believe, I do believe, I believe, I hate saying I do believe, I believe that Bitcoin will help us get our time back. And with our time back, we can, we can delve into things that are more stimulating than spreadsheets and traffic and keeping the boss happy. You know, we can actually live, we can learn the guitar, like you were saying, we can read that book that's been on our shelves for a long time and we can spend more time with family and friends. I honestly think the way that money is, is the base measurement of our time and energy. If the money's broken, then we're debasing our time and energy. But if we fix the money, then we can get our time back and, and dedicate our energy to more things that are, that please us a bit more. So I, I think that's where like, um, Bitcoin and education crossover because there's so many people there who do deep down have the potential to, or the, the drive to just self teach and, or create. It doesn't even need to be about like what you know, it's about what you do. Like I have a lot of friends who are artists, but the Bitcoin artists are the ones who are getting their time back. So they're spending more and more time on the rod. And I know a few full-time Bitcoin artists, but if I know, I talked to anybody else that was an artist that tried doing the artist thing, it didn't work out because they, they couldn't get the time they needed to to just do that thing. But the Bitcoiners are working it out and the Bitcoiners are learning to sail and we'll be building houses and we'll be looking after families and we'll be, um, you know, I think that's an amazing, yeah. Yeah. I think that's an, a, such an amazing point because if, if, 
if you just like increase your earning capability, of course, at some point you will also be financially free and, and be have more time. But what's way more powerful is then the capital accumulation. So like if, if you save your money in US dollar, which is still the, the best out of the, the worst, uh, and then uh, you, you lose your time o over time. Like you lose, yep. your, it's a funny, you lose your financial energy over time. Yep. So for example, my podcast um, is, is, is great. Like it, 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 it grows and, and with AI and with all those tools that I have, I'm actually able to do that daily, even though I'm alone. Uh, so like with, with time, it, it will bring more uh, and uh, I might be more efficient because of the technology. Uh, but the, the biggest advantage that I have is that I myself adopted a Bitcoin standard in, in, in the personal treasury, if you, if you call it like that. I think that will be the, the, the major advantage. I think I will not beat like the r revenue counted this year from the podcast in Bitcoin will probably be more than uh, in 10 years time. I don't know, may, may, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I think it will be very hard to do, to beat that uh, Bitcoin uh, target. And so it's really interesting when you look at, uh, when you create something, you get value, it really matters where you save that <laughs> value. It really matters where you put that uh, because otherwise you're just like, in a better hamster wheel you're just in a in a better <laughs> hard working mode and uh yeah in the past you had to do all with like real estate you had to do stocks you have to do all those things to be also good off like it wasn't it was also possible before bitcoin but it, it required a lot of work and a lot of attention uh towards that and now it's just like saving bitcoin and concentrate all your time in providing value. And I love that so much that we are able to do that. And this also um, activated a lot in me and, and probably also with you, right? Yeah, I, I, I think that's the thing. That's that's the other side of it. Like Bitcoin, it's potential to, to, to outperform pretty much any asset that you mentioned, like stocks and real estate and the US dollar and gold is is the kind of like you know up and to the right way we see things but you mentioned something that's super important as well which is like what is the required maintenance time of holding bitcoin like how much like upkeep how much how much time per day do me and you dedicate to keeping our bitcoin like you know zero like i wake up it's cold stored like i go to sleep it's still there i wake up the next day and it's still there it, like the other models that we have are like you know you get a good job, but it never pays enough and your salary is going down because of inflation. So then you get a side hustle, you know, like everybody's got this gig economy. So you'll have a Shopify and you'll sell stuff. Or, you know, if you're a bit more TradFi, you'll be like, hey, I'm going to do stocks and like I'll have like these platforms and these bots and you delve into that. Or if you're a bit more, you know, like I want something physical, bricks and mortar, you'll buy a real estate. But all of those three things, whether it be a side hustle, whether it be stocks, whether it be like real estate, you're going to have to fit that into your already busy week, right? So you're just committing even more time to assets that won't even perform as well as Bitcoin. So at what point is that a good exchange of time versus future potential and future freedom and finance? It's not like you're giving in the present, like Bitcoin isn't asking much of you as an investor or a Bitcoiner or a hodler or whatever you want to call is. I think, cognitively and like psychologically and, and, and in terms of like, yeah, there are some core basics of how to transact with Bitcoin that you need to master. And there's some key concepts economically that you need to understand. So you, you have the conviction to hodl throughout the, the drops and, and not freak out when it hits an all time high and, you know, just behaviorally just learning to become a Bitcoiner, but that doesn't actually take that long. And then once that's been done, you just sit back. Like it's super easy and with its performance and the zero amount of upkeep it requires, it's, that's how it gives you your time back. I think, I think, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. There are two sides to being a Bitcoin. One is it's got huge potential for, for growth and two, it requires zero upkeep pretty much. Um, 
you can be a really lazy Bitcoiner, but still very successful. And I think that's why um, that's why we, I think we will slide in the singularity of Bitcoin, uh, singularity of money, where we only have Bitcoin because it will be so much better than anything else out there. Obviously, we will still have companies and stocks and venture capitalists. And we will have a financial market, uh, but but they will be extremely demonetized and the monetary premium will be in Bitcoin. And I hope we also get to a point where we don't have hundreds of currencies all around the world that are different exchange rates and yet a foreign a Forex market and stuff like that. Like I, I hope to, all those fear things that kind of fall away and distract humanity from providing value to each other uh, and uh, I, I hope really we get to a point where, where this all gets gets away and we slide in this singularity of money which is bitcoin do you also see it like that that we long term there is no way th there's like this bitcoin we will go through and uh, it will all consolidate to towards that end boss of of money yeah i think the key word you used is value you know, like uh, taking the example you used about all these different currencies, like having worked in TradFi, like that's where these companies exist. They they exist on the friction between the diversity. So if you want to move from Australian dollars to euros, like there's a friction, you know, so the company jumps in there, they'll charge you a commission and and they'll they'll do all of these uh, these mechanisms. Or if you want to move from one cell phone provider to the other, they'll charge you exit fees. And if you want to have like some streaming subscription to listen to your movies, like you'll have to have a lot of different ones. Every time there's diversity of those types of things where we lose a little bit of value in what it is, right? You know, and I think finance is, is the best one. Like I suppose it's like people like Strike and like like uh, Jack Mallers that are doing things about international remittances, but you've got people uh, living on different sides of the world that grew up in other parts and they're sending money from one place to the other. That's the best example is like, you know, the Western unions of the world where they exist on the friction and they take a huge cut and they make things they make them um they make you as dependent as possible like that friction they love it because that's why they can enter into the marketplace and and make a profit off of the friction and the frustration and the challenges of you not being able to do that but if you remove that friction by just having the singularity of bitcoin then everything you don't lose the value you know if if i send bitcoin from canada where i am to brazil it's not going to lose as much of its value as if I was to move Canadian dollars over to to yourself in euros, I'd lose on the spread, right? But Bitcoin to Bitcoin is is pretty much frictionless. You know, there's a minor fee, but you're supporting the community. So you don't lose value when you have like single levels of protocol. I think uh, I think that's it, really. I think yeah, uh -huh. it would help deliver like more consistency and, and again, uh, getting the time back because we're not losing value on, on the friction. How do you think we 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 get there? Because obviously Bitcoin is extremely Bitcoin has such a huge uh, potential that it is right now really really small <laughs> compared to what's the potential for Bitcoin, and uh, also not a lot of Bit people are in Bitcoin compared to how many people could potentially be in Bitcoin. Um, and I'm always really fascinated of like how how. How are we starting from like this, what we have built in the last 15 years uh, to getting in, in the next like 15, 20, 30, 50 years to, to scale up to 8 billion people? Uh, how, do, how do you envision that? Like, what are the challenges that 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 we will face a, a, a along, along the line? I kind of have two ways of thinking about it. Like, number one is there are huge challenges. And that's that's where I operate at the moment. And number two, there are very few challenges because Bitcoin will just continue to be awesome and do its thing. And, you know, it has this magnetism that people will be drawn to it. Uh, the way it's anti-fragile, the way it plays out through game theory, it'll become more and more present in our everyday lives um, just because of its design. So the second part is is kind of quite easy to just throw off saying like, it'll, it'll just happen. Like it's already in, in process and Bitcoin, TikTok, next block. But the first part is like uh, is kind of where I want to make an impact about you know how we how can we uh, how can we move things forward how can we help people get on board as quick as possible and uh, within that there's always like a couple ways of seeing things and there's like is Bitcoin adoption top down or bottom up 
so like one of the, one of the best pieces of news as far as i can remember in terms of bitcoin adoption the biggest news was el salvador's adoption of bitcoin right you know a nation state took on bitcoin it was everybody talked about it you know the newspaper front page has become like a collector's item and bukele became like a, you know a figurehead of bitcoin adoption but at the end of the day that was a top down adoption and I'm looking forward to seeing what it's like. I'm actually heading out to El Salvador soon for the very first time, and I'm going to see what it's like. Um, because personally, as as a self-titled, and it might be lame now, three years after it was first coined, but as like a Bitcoin evangelist, I still do see that Bitcoin adoption should be bottom up rather than top down. Um, and being able to get into that sphere, which is what I was saying about marching out of the citadel and meeting people on the battlefield and pulling them out of the the melee that that is the mainstream culture, is kind of how it should be happening. And and that's where some of the challenges are, right? You know, it's in and that's what I like to do at the moment. What I'm doing is with my background in finance, my background in education, and my frustrations with both of those sectors. Bitcoiners gave me this amazing ability to understand that you know you can you can hack things. So what I'm trying to do is is hack my is is hack Bitcoin education by finding out different ways we can help people learn. Because not everybody's a self-taught person. It kind of circles back to everything we were just saying about, you know, the people who are self-taught and curious about Bitcoin are already in Bitcoin. So we've got to stop thinking that everybody will self-learn and is curious about Bitcoin. It's it's not the case. We're already here, right? And we're talking to each other all the time. But um for the people who are not on that side of the bell curve, well, what can we offer them that will help Bitcoin adoption? And that's what I'm trying to design at Bull Bitcoin is like, um, I call it evangelization 2.0, instead of like telling them that macroeconomics and Austrian economics and like, yeah, but the white paper and like, here's the code and this is what open source is. Like people actually need to grasp basic concepts through different means than like white papers and in-depth podcasts and I'm trying to make like uh, activities and workshops and interaction and role plays and games and, you know, all of those teacher tools that, that we use in the traditional educational system to help, help people understand complex things. We should be rolling those tools out across Bitcoin. Um, so that's kind of the way that I see Bitcoin education looking like and adoption going. Um, it's, you know, I still believe that, you know, political lobbying and hoping that, you know, more and more higher ups, adopt Bitcoin companies, bring it onto their balance sheets and politicians bring it onto the, onto the political debate, onto the political debates. But, um, I, I'm not in that. I'm not a CEO of a huge company. Um, <laughs> I sit here at uh, 6 AM and editing the podcast. And I just realized I cannot really, because in this podcast, the internet and uh, VPN and things like that, and the, his camera fall out multiple times and we had to restart the recording. And this was the last time where it actually fell out. Uh, and the previous times the, the, uh, the overlays were okay. And now I was like, yeah, the <laughs> <laughs> the cut is so hard and we did not start the conversation where we ended it. So I wanted to just uh, clarify uh, that, that, yeah, we, we had technical problems, but I still wanted to have the last part of the conversation also in uh, because I think it's interesting and that's why I'm here editing in my uh, gym clothes and just wanted to record this quick video so you know uh, where you are. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for watching that far already. I really appreciate that. And if you haven't done so uh, please subscribe it really helps me out to find bigger guests to find more guests and to hopefully orange pill the world a little bit more thank you so much and it's recording perfect fine very good cool man <laughs> yeah this is going to cause you a few headaches in post but, uh, i'm sure this isn't the first time you have to do with stuff like this no uh you are my oh yeah you're my 299th podcast so like man. tomorrow i have my 300th <laughs> congratulations yeah, that's wild. That's a lot of time. And uh, how long, how, how many, uh, how many months and years is that? When did you first start? Uh, I started uh, 28th of November last year. So it's like 11 months now. <gasps> Man, you've been doing a lot of podcasts. Yeah, I do it. Now I do it daily. Uh, I started with like once a week, then twice a week and f three times a week. I, I was like, the, the short story of that is like, I just put out like the calendar link that you also got. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was coming from sales. So I was like, oh, I will 
just message 50 people and maybe three come on my podcast. But I messaged 50 people and like 45 people came on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, dope, so man. That, 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 that was kind of like my mistake in the beginning. And then I had like this queue of people that I have to interview and I still had like a full-time job. Uh, but I was like, yeah, let's, let's stick to it. Let's do it. Uh, let's, let's hustle. Uh, and then I had like two months in advance recordings and I was like, that's, that's like weird. Like I, I record now and say like, yeah, I will publish it in two months. That's, that seems to be very fine in the future. Yeah. And then I was like just moving up the, the, the weekly uploads to yeah, basically then in the end uh, every day. And I still have like two weeks uh, worth of recordings now. And uh, sometimes even do two recordings per day. So it's fascinating how many people there are in Bitcoin uh, that are willing to talk on a podcast. I thought I will run out of people, but I barely scratched the surface. I feel like. <laughs> no, I mean, you can, you can talk with everybody on the, on the bull Bit Bitcoin team, pretty much everybody's very, uh, I think like podcasts, it's nice to get the time to sit down and, and have the long format conversation. This is like, uh, like for example, with like Donald Trump, who sat down with Joe Rogan the other day. Um, I listened to like the whole three hours and I was like, wow, it took, took a bit of effort to listen to the whole three hours. But at the same time, like the subjects that come up and the way that the conversation flows and the things that you can kind of reach together throughout conversation is a, a much more natural to how we used to engage. You know, we used to sit down for an evening over food and discuss things. Now we're all over the world. So we we do podcasts, but I think the result is the same in terms of like the processing of ideas and the sharing of experiences. And so, so I think that's why a lot of Bitcoiners are very willing to join your Bitcoin podcast as well is because it, it helps everybody, you know, like I, I love talking about Bitcoin and like some of the, the questions make you think differently. And at the end of it, you level up. Like I feel that both people like guest and host after a podcast do level up rather than like a five minute interview on Fox news, like in between two like articles, you don't have time to, uh, to connect. So yeah, I, I, I can understand why there's a lot of people want to be on the podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. It just shocked me that so many people were want to be on, wanted to be on a podcast before there was even like a podcast, like I literally like there was none a podcast existing. I just had like a small, like 6k, uh, Twitter following. And I was like, okay, like it's, it's some following. So, uh, people know I'm actually a Bitcoiner. I'm not like some shit coiner. I'm not a scammer. I, I, like they, they kind of knew like I was legit in the space from my Twitter history, but still like it was a non-existing Bitcoin podcast and, and Jeff Booth was the biggest surprise. He really gets on every small podcast. He is so humble. Uh, like he, like he really doesn't have to do that. Uh, but he really wants to do that. And he does that to promote smaller people, uh, smaller podcasters also. And it's, 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 uh, I think I, I like, I'm surprised by the humbleness and the kindness of the Bitcoin community, to be honest, that, that completely shocked me and learned about the Bitcoin community, how humble and kind, uh, <laughs> every, everyone is in, in, in here. Yeah, I think that's a nice thing that you find once you do take that move to surround yourself with Bitcoiners is like, uh, you know, we always say like, um, like, don't trust verify was like a core belief in, in Bitcoin and still is in terms of the protocol and like securing stuff and your devices. But then when you start hanging out with Bitcoiners on a social level, like these are some of the people that I would trust the most because, you know, the base protocols have already been established. When I show up to an event, for example, and I've never really met people in real life, but uh, we know each other it really doesn't take long to become like, like friends with people because there's a lot of stuff that's been done separately and you can connect a lot quicker. And, and some people that I know through Bitcoin now, I, I trust way much more than if we were just colleagues or friends or neighbors. It's because we're Bitcoiners. Like that's, that's something that's really cool about, I hate the word community because everybody overuses the word community, but, um, but it is part of like that, that sense of belonging like opens people up like, Oh, right. Okay. Let's, let's share more. Let's collaborate more. Let's, uh, let's help each other more because, uh, you know, we're all in it together. I suppose it is a movement without it sounding like a, a sect or anything, but, uh, you know, there is a part of like the movement that we all help each other out. Absolutely. Yeah. And I had uh, a discussion with people who actually were in sects, like, like actual <laughs> sects. And they said like, yeah, I get why people compare it, but if you were actually once in a sect, 
it's nothing like that. Bitcoin community is such an open, welcoming, non-toxic community. I mean, we, we kind of seem toxic when you just look at Twitter, <laughs> but, but that's not the representation of the actual Bitcoin community. Go out there on a Bitcoin conference, uh, uh, watch a Bitcoin podcast. That's more the grasp of what Bitcoin community actually is. I feel like on Twitter and social media on like the short form, especially text form, uh, we, we came across way more toxic, but it's such a, uh, yeah nice community as you as you said and yeah i completely overlooked the time we are actually quite uh, advanced already um uh, bef- one question that i ask all my guests is what can we learn from you besides bitcoin and that's actually uh, kind of closing the loop to, to one of my, <laughs> the, the f- uh, first topics that we discussed having identity outside of, of bitcoin um so we talked a little bit about it but is there something that uh, you really want to share outside of bitcoin uh, about you or a skill or whatever like you can go in any direction yeah i i think that is um Maybe the reason why I am in Bitcoin is because I, it's kind of funny. I don't want to be in Bitcoin, but I, I, I know I need to go through Bitcoin to get to where I want to go, which, which is, uh, I always see myself as an educator first and a Bitcoiner second. And it is something that, you know, that's, that's my final, like when we won, <laughs> that's where I'll be going. I know where I want to go already, which is, which is back into education. And uh, that kind of vision also fits in with Bull Bitcoin's kind of vision. Like we we exist as an exchange, so that eventually one day we won't be relevant. You know, we we work, so we'll eventually no longer exist. Because if we no longer exist, it means people don't need to exchange fiat for Bitcoin. They just have Bitcoin. So when a Bitcoin standard exists, the exchange doesn't need to stay open. So it kind of kind of fits with where I. Uh, where I place myself with bull Bitcoin as well. Like we're all working towards eventually being able to hang up the, uh, the, the bull Bitcoin, uh, well, the, the kind of Bitcoin uh, uniform and then going about doing what we really always wanted to do. But um, we're here, this is the battlefield. You know, we have the Citadel where we go and rest between each, uh, each podcast and each event and each meetup. Uh, and we talk between ourselves over Twitter and stuff, but uh, we always, march out onto the battlefield, but eventually the battle will be won and then we can, uh, we can move on to other things. So for me, it's always education, but I always like the way of like, I think the human brain is wonderful and being able to understand it and find new ways of pre- presenting information so that people understand it. That type of connection is something that's magic to me. I always like the Eureka moment, um, in education. And if you can be the person who helps hand that Eureka moment over to somebody, it's like, uh, it's everything to me. So. I, I I found that there's so much things people don't know about Bitcoin that I can deliver those Eureka moments. But eventually when everybody's learned Bitcoin and everybody gets it or they don't even need to get it, it just exists. Um, I'll, I'll go on to other things and, and help help hand over those Eureka moments again and again and again because it's something I really live for. Uh, that's that's extremely uh, beautiful. I love that a lot. Really, really cool. Um, perfect. And let's come to the end routine of the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, and <laughs> I honestly, I usually have an answer for the questions that I get for my next guest, but I wouldn't have an answer for that question. Uh, but maybe you have one. Um, is scarcity a fundament, fundamental feature of Bitcoin or is it a consequence of Bitcoin's fundamental features. I think it's fundamental, the scarcity thing, because I think one of the, the a eureka moment for me um, was when I was talking with Francis about like some, some work we were, we were, we were putting together and he's like, I think you're missing the key point. And I was like, what is it? He was like, well, because on the supply and demand curve, like Bitcoin is the first ever economic asset where you can't increase the supply. Like that's how, that's what makes it so robust. And, you know, like, you know, everything we've used in the past, like, uh, you know, fiat, but pre-fiat like gold and, and diamonds, like, even though these things are scarce to some degree, you can increase supply. You can go and mine more. You can even fake diamonds nowadays by synthesizing them. So, you know, you, you can flood markets. It might take a while, but you can flood markets if the demand's high enough by increasing supply, but Bitcoin doesn't ever increase the supply. And that's the thing that we agree on. That's the 21 million, you know, or infinity divided by 21 million. So I think it's part of its design and I think it's what's fundamental to it. And it's, it's scarce in a unique way as well. It's not that it has scarcity. It's that it's scarcity is 
its beauty. Its, its scarcity is its uniqueness. And the, the type of scarcity it has hasn't existed before. Um, so I, I think it's fundamental and I think it's a core design. Even when you look at it in other ways, it helps you to explain the volatility of Bitcoin. It's like when you're, exp you know, sometimes people are like, yeah, but Bitcoin's really volatile. It's like, it is volatile, but it's a feature, not a bug because of the scarcity, right? You know, usually if you have a different market that's, and they go through volatility, well, they can smooth volatility by increase, increasing supply. Um, but you can't increase supply on Bitcoin. So it, it does play into its volatility. It, it doesn't help smooth volatility. But it's, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a feature, not a bug. Because in the long term, you don't want to debase assets for the sake of short-term volatility smoothing. You want long-term growth. So it's built on that scarcity. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a core thing. That 21 million is like ride or die. You know, so I love it. Yeah, that's, I love that too. Really, really cool. Um, that was a beautiful one also. Really cool. Thank you so much. Uh, before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can people reach out to you and ask questions? Yeah. Um, what I'd probably say is you can reach out to me individually at Saxtron3000 on Twitter. Um, if not, you can look up Bull Bitcoin. We're at bullbitcoin underscore on Twitter and bullbitcoin.com is our website. We're available in Canada, Costa Rica, and France at the moment as an exchange. Um, you can follow Francis Pouliot as well, who's the founder of Bull Bitcoin. He's always got something interesting to say. He lives in the Bitcoin jungle out there in Uvita. And the next time I'll probably be in public, we'll be adopting Bitcoin. So if anybody's making it out to adopting Bitcoin, come say hello and uh, let's put in some real time in the meat space and let's make this happen. If anybody has anything they want to collaborate on, especially regarding Bitcoin education, please get in contact. But um, Robin, thanks very much for your time. Really, really cool. I will also be in, in, in El Salvador. Nice. I think this podcast will actually come out uh, right around the time. So maybe it's the, the El Salvador conference is <laughs> right, right now. It's coming up, eh? Uh, it's coming up really, really soon. In, in like 10 days, I will be there. Uh, so yeah, really cool. Thank you so much for your time. Pablo, also thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.